Hello, this is Keith Geyser with a word of wisdom from the Gospel according to Mark. And today we're in Mark chapter 2, verse 1, in the second chapter of the Gospel according to Mark. We're beginning at the beginning, verse 1. And again he entered Capernaum after some days, and it was heard that he was in the house. Immediately many gathered together so that there was no longer room to receive them, not even near the door. And he preached the word to them. Then they came to him, bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. And when they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. So when they had broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven you. And we'll see the sequel to that event in a moment. But just to take our bearings, once again, Mark is this gospel that is just suffused with activity, that we read about the Lord Jesus doing something, and he does something else, and he does the next thing. The word immediately is another one of those key words, that this is the servant of the Lord, the promised servant that Isaiah and others had talked about in the Old Testament, and he's come to do the will of his father, and so he's the perfect servant as Mark presents him. Prior to this, of course, was the healing of the man with leprosy at the end of chapter 1. And he came to the Lord with that request, saying, Rabbi, if you're willing, you can make me clean. And the Lord Jesus not only said, I'm willing, but he reached out and he touched the man, which was extraordinary, because when we think of how long that man would have gone, probably without any human touch, given the dangerous and the ceremonially unclean nature of his malady, for the Lord Jesus to reach out and touch him was indeed tremendous compassion. And the Lord's still able to reach down into our lives and touch us, that whatever our problem is, and of course the biggest, most common problem among humanity is sin, is being separated from God in our sins if we don't know the Lord Jesus. And yet we can cry out to God at any time, as dirty as we might be, and as much as our conscience might be tarnished, we can cry out to the Lord and say, Lord, touch me and save me. And the Lord reaches out to touch us, and from him flow cleansing and healing, and of course, no defilement comes upon him. The Lord Jesus took our sins on himself on the cross of Calvary and died for them. And the Lord Jesus rose again. He is now completely separate from sinners and made higher than the heavens. He's never going to have to die for sin anymore because he offered that one perfect sacrifice for sin and that leprous man was healed. So for him to touch the Lord, if he had touched me or anyone else, we would have been defiled, if not outright contaminated by the contagion. But under the Jewish law, we would have been made ceremonially unclean. But for the Lord Jesus, there was no uncleanness that accrued to him. Rather, the leprous man was purified. And the Lord Jesus told him to go and offer the sacrifice to the priests that Moses had commanded. Imagine, Leviticus had given very specific instructions on how to deal with leprosy and when a leper was cleansed to bring the proper offering to the Lord. And the Lord told the leprous man to bring that as a testimony to them. What a statement that would have been to the priests that Messiah was on the scene. I'm sure they didn't get many former lepers coming to offer that sacrifice. We don't read about very many in the Bible prior to the time of Christ being cleansed. And Naaman the Syrian, way back in 2 Kings chapter 5, in the days of Elisha, he really stands out. But when we think about this man, if he had gone to the priests, as the Lord said, and offered the sacrifice, it would have demonstrated our Lord's submission under the law, because Galatians 4.4 4 says, In the fullness of time God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. And yet it would have led those high priests to ask how he was cleansed, and it would have led them to consider the Lord Jesus without the bias of thinking, oh, this man is a lawbreaker, this man is against our law. Now, nonetheless, when we get to the second chapter, we find a group of stories about the Lord Jesus that the Holy Spirit has arranged here that are going to bring the Lord Jesus into conflict with the religious leaders of his day. And that's because they erroneously judge who the Lord Jesus is, 
and what he's doing. And their assumption is that the Lord Jesus is against their law, particularly the law that uh, is first one that's going to be a problem is the law regarding the Sabbath. Now, in the days when the Lord Jesus came to Israel, of course, the Ten Commandments were very much in force. And that fourth commandment, the commandment to observe the Sabbath, was in force. And our Lord was not a Sabbath breaker. I say he was not a Sabbath breaker because the Sabbath rightly understood and rightly practiced was never violated by the Lord Jesus. But what was violated was the improper practice of the Sabbath or the traditions that had been added to codify and define what the Sabbath was. Because the religious establishment of the day had said, well, we don't want to break the Sabbath, so let's put a fence around it. Let's make some extra rules to govern it. And pretty soon over the centuries, those traditions, those extra rules were elevated to a level where they had the same authority as the scripture. Beware of anyone, Jew or Gentile, who elevates human tradition to the same level as the scripture. Our authority is in the Bible alone, because that's the infallible word of God. That's what 2 Timothy 3.16 says is God-breathed. The only kind of tradition we are to follow is apostolic tradition. In other words, what was handed down to the apostles from the Holy Spirit, and that was coming from the risen Christ. He gave it to the apostles by the Holy Spirit. This became what Acts 2.42 calls the apostles' doctrine, and that's what they handed down. Paul spoke about the traditions or the ordinances in 1 Corinthians 11 and in other passages like 1 Corinthians 15 as well. But these things were handed down from the Lord, not just handed down by a conclave of students or scholars or whomever it may have been. Now, this hubbub about the formerly a formerly leprous man who was now cleansed, of course, generated a lot of publicity. And our Lord was never one who had that mindset that any publicity is good publicity. In fact, Mark over and over shows the Lord doing things in a very purposeful and we might even say a guarded fashion. Now, the Lord isn't out there casting pearls before swine. He isn't indiscriminately putting the truth before people. True, he is doing miracles. These are works of power. He is doing supernatural things, which the Gospels will call, especially John will call, signs. They are pointing to his messianic identity. The Lord gives enough evidence that one can come and believe in him. But there needs to be a response on our part, where we come and investigate. When the some of the first disciples came after the Lord Jesus in John 1, and they say, Rabbi, where dwellest thou? Our Lord's response to them was, come and see. And so that's what the Lord really invites people to do to this very day. You want to know about the Lord Jesus Christ? You want to know about what he's all about? Come and see. Investigate his word. Make the honest attempt, which so many uh, pretend to do but never do, to actually open the Word of God, to read the Gospels, and to say, now I'm going to, as uncritically as I can, or, or, or I should say, as unbiasedly as I can. We do want to be critical thinkers. We do want to evaluate uh, correctly, and we do want to examine things historically. Christianity never bids us check our brains at the door. But we want to examine the Scriptures and say, now who is the Lord Jesus, and what did he come to do, and what's that have to do with me? And when we study through the scriptures, we find out the Lord Jesus is the Son of God who became incarnate. In other words, the Son of God who came from heaven and became a real man, albeit a sinless man, a man who went to the cross of Calvary to die for our sins and rise again so that we could have eternal life with God. And whoever repents, that is, turns from themselves and their sin and says, Lord Jesus, save me a sinner, putting their trust in him, what the Bible calls faith where we not only intellectually believe and assent to something, but knowing the facts intellectually, we commit ourselves to the Lord. We say, Lord, take my life and let it be consecrated to you. Come in and save me and make me a new creature in Christ Jesus. Well, out of the publicity of that leper being cleansed, we find out there was this great crowd, and now the Lord Jesus was hindered somewhat 
in his movements. And so these men who brought this man to the Lord Jesus had to go to unorthodox means. The Lord Jesus was in a house in Capernaum, according to chapter 2, verse 1, and immediately many gathered together so that there was no longer room to receive them, not even near the door. So you can imagine this room chock full of people and people maybe hanging in by the windows if there's windows and just standing room only, we might say, just not really hardly any room to breathe. All of these people wanting to be near the Lord Jesus and see what he's going to do. And of course, the Lord Jesus responds the way he usually does in verse two, the last phrase there, it says, and he preached the word to them. So our Lord did what he came to do. He preached the word. Our Lord was showing them God the Father, showing them what the Father's will was, explaining to them the kingdom of God and explaining uh, what he had come to do. And so he was preaching this to them. But there were these four friends who had another friend who was paralyzed, and they obviously couldn't get this man into this house. If it ever was handicap accessible, it was now nearly impossible for even a non-disabled person to enter, so full was it of people. And yet these four men came in, and I like their ingenuity. I like the fact that they aren't going to let anything keep them from the Lord Jesus. Now, is there anything keeping you from coming to him? Is there some sin you love that you don't want to give up? And you know, if you come to the Lord Jesus, your life's going to have to change. Well, it will change if you come to Jesus, but let me tell you, it'll change for the better. He is the best Lord and Master and Savior anyone could ever have, and frankly, he's the only game in town. There's no other name given among men under heaven whereby we must be saved, Acts 4.12 tells us. So come to the Lord Jesus. Don't let anything stop you. And these men went up on the roof of this house, and they uncovered that, and they let this paralyzed man down through. Can you imagine that? I've always thought about the homeowner. I wonder if he was looking for his insurance agent to see if he was covered for this. <laughs> but in any case, it was an amazing thing when they saw suddenly light coming down through the ceiling and a hole. And obviously there's some men up there and they're letting down this paralyzed man. A lot of the uh, homes in that area, the historians tell us, had thatched kind of roofs and so they could break through quite easily to do this kind of thing with some effort. They let that paralyzed man down. Now, if you saw a man on a stretcher, paralyzed as he was, what would you say the greatest need of this man was? Most people would probably say, well, he needs physical healing. I mean, here's a paralyzed man, and they didn't have computers, they didn't have all the technology we have today, so people who were disabled, especially severely disabled like this man, their quality of life was rather low. He couldn't go out and do a job. At best, he had to live on the charity of others or maybe even be put out somewhere to beg, like the lame man who was put in front of the temple in Acts chapter 3. But when the Lord Jesus looks at this man, he doesn't see, first of all, the physical disability. As serious as physical disability may be, the first thing the Lord says is to address his biggest problem. He says in verse 5, Son, your sins are forgiven you. So our biggest problem is whether we are able-bodied or whether we are physically afflicted somehow. That's not the big issue. The big issue is, where do we stand with God? Has anything been done about our sin? Are our sins, are we still dead in trespasses and sins? Separated from God by those sins. We need someone to deal with those sins. And the Lord Jesus looked down at this young man and said some of the most beautiful words that a human being can ever hear from their creator, God. Son, your sins are forgiven you. Have you heard that? I'm so thankful I heard that from the Lord Jesus in 1980, not literally and audibly, uh, but in reading the word of God, I came to the understanding that I myself was a sinner. I was the sinner for whom Christ died, and I needed to bow the knee and say, my Lord and my God, be merciful to me, a sinner. The Lord Jesus saved me, and I'm so thankful today that my sins are forgiven, not because I'm better than other people. I was probably much worse than a lot of people my age. I was saved as a child, and I was doing things and thinking things that were wrong. And I often think if the Lord hadn't saved me back then, what kind of a teenager, what kind of an adult I would have come, but for his grace. Even after 
coming to Christ and being a Christian in my early years in particular, I still did things today that I look back on with shame and still in my uh, current life, I have to keep close to the Lord and go to the Lord every day really and confess sin because every day I find myself still falling short of the glory of God and so often doing things that I'm ashamed of. But how good to think that salvation and forgiveness of sins isn't based on what we do. It's based on the proclamation of God through the Lord Jesus Christ. It's based on one who went to the cross and died for those sins, who paid for them so that we could be freed from them. And he rose again to prove that that payment was real, that he was authentic, that he was true, that he is the savior of the world, and that whoever receives him could have eternal life, and they too could be freed from sin and from the penalty of sin, which is being separated from God, not only in this life, but also in the world to come, being put into the lake of fire. What an awful thing that would be, especially when the Lord wants so much to say to you, your sins are forgiven you. Now, in our next study, we'll see what the reaction was by the people around and unpack the implications of that for ourselves as well. So thank you very much.